Good day, this is Dr. Conrad Miller giving you your Fukushima update for July 2013. We're trying to condense the lectures and discussions and information from the New York City Fukushima Symposium from March of 2013 relative to the Fukushima nuclear accident that occurred on March 11, 2011. Steve Wing from the University of North Carolina from the Department of Epidemiology spoke to us about studies and their defects relative to nuclear accidents and nuclear plants and Fukushima. First he mentioned the World Health Organization health risk estimate assessment for Fukushima. Uh, it was based on dose estimates made in 2012 and also based on the lifespan study of A-bomb survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the bombs fell on those cities in Japan in 1945. He noted that the dose assessment by the, the World Health Organization for Fukushima, uh, the committee chose not to involve the population of Fukushima within 20 kilometers of the nuclear plant and not to assess the radioactive gases that were released, such as xenon and infection lungs, and it didn't assess fetal doses. And we know that Fetal doses uh, have produced microcephaly, small brain, neural tu tube defects, spina bifida, as Dr. Wordelecki's lecture was shared with you. And they did admit that uh, there would be an increase in thyroid cancer of about 70% of females 0 to 5 years old at the time of the accident. But there were no numbers given, as Dr. Fairley mentioned to us relative to uh, numbers for health risk to plant workers, although they said that would, the risk would increase. Uh, there were no discernible risks and health risks expected outside of Japan. They say, you know, all that, that radiation was released around the Earth and into the oceans. About 80% went into the oceans. And uh, the health risks for Japan in general were predicted to be low by the World Health Organization. But again, no numbers. So, Dr. Wing told us about the Hiroshima and Nagasaki studies. Basically, they didn't start until five years after the bombing in 1945. They started in 1950. So, uh, if mortality from the immediate effects of the bombings is related at all to frailty, frail people who may have expired before 1950, and to longer-term risk, there would have been a harvesting of the most radiosensitive people from this population if the study had started immediately. So the, su the study selected for healthier people. 100% of the people at the hypocenter in 1945 where the bombs fell died. 50% of the people were killed within a kilometer and a half. And you should know that the study, the lifespan study, omitted all cancers that occurred within 13 years of the exposure. The cancer incidence part of the study didn't start until 1958. So lots of cancers in that time span will occur, uh, including in utero exposure, uh, related cancers and malformations and uh, DNA effects, mutations, shorter latency cancers like leukemia, lung cancer, um, also, the committee that did the study decided not to include residual radiation composed of induced radiation, which was from the bomb going into the soil and coming out of the soil, and then include the fallout that drifted to dis distant areas. And that's very important in an epidemiological study because it means that the fallout is disproportionately affecting people with the lowest doses directly from the gamma neutrons from the blast, but not included in the study. So they talked about the black rain that, fought, that fell. The 86,671 survivors were asked, and 12,400 saw the black rain or the fallout. 52,948 said don't. they didn't, but 21,000 there's no information from them. They weren't interviewed properly and they weren't given a dose, for example. They, nobody knows if they saw the black rain or they didn't. Um, it's a very important time between 1950 and 1962 
because there was a very large excess mortality among people who provided no information on their exposure and exposure to black rain. So the early entrants, the people that could have been exposed to induced radiation near the hypercenter, um, that's a differential exposure to a type of radiation that's not counted in the lifespan study. So there's a high excess mortality from 1950 to 1962 of those who have no information on the black rain, and that's not included in the study properly. Dr. Wing did a study with his group in North Carolina on the Hiroshima and the Nagasaki survivors. They broke the people down into three groups of survivors, the proximal survivors that were located within three kilometers of the blast, and then the distal survivors that were more than three kilometers away. They didn't do detailed interviews on these distal survivors, so they couldn't produce a dose estimate, really. However, for some reason, they assigned all of them to the lowest dose category, and then there were survivors with a missing dose, about 3,000. 443 compared to 42,000 survivors and 16,000 proximal survivors and 16,000 distal survivors. So there's a high, there are higher rates of mortality among survivors with unknown doses, it turns out, from all causes, from all cancers and from leukemia, for example. So we're taking out of the high-dose group the people with the highest mortality rates, and that adversely affects the dose response estimate that you, we make with the lifespan study. So in all in the analyses of the research uh, organization that did the study to estimate the risk coefficients that are applied to populations all around the world, even today, uh, people in the study from 1950 uh, who shouldn't have been in the study until later when they were assigned the dose, Dr. Wing calls a phenomenon called immortal person time that epidemiologists use that inflates the denominator of the cancer rates for the proximal survivors. So in other words, you're the bigger the denominator, the smaller the number. So this is another phenomenon that causes an underestimate of the cancer rates for the proximal survivors, and Dr. Wing has an article on this in a recent uh, edition of the Journal of Epidemiology. Again, there's no data in the lifespan study for carcinogenic effects of in utero exposure. And we know that the embryo and the fetus are very sensitive to carcinogenic effects of radiation, more so than kids. So the lifespan study gives no information on this at all. And this is left out of many dose estimates that we see from the lifespan study. So we have these four events and studies that Dr. Wing told us about, again, the studies have projected and based on lifespan ABOM studies and what they show at low doses of what they call low doses, 5 rems, when 200 millirems is uh, your background radiation, and that's 25 times higher than your background radiation. And Dr. Wing was told that, uh, or told us that very a very high number of people need to be studied, hundreds and thousands to millions of people, and they need to be followed for life to harvest any information. So when he was starting out in radiation studies in 1998, he worked on the Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, people with their radiation badges. And he was told probably you wouldn't find anything because the sample size was too small and the doses were too low. But uh, he jumped in at a 20-year latency time, and guess what? He saw a dose-response relationship. The higher the dose in the badge, the higher the cancer rates in these people who worked there. But this was impossible. And then Chernobyl occurred in 1986, and the International Atomic Energy Association in 1991 came out with a statement in their project. On the basis of doses estimated by the project teams and currently accepted radiation risk estimates, future increases over natural incidence of cancers or hereditary effects would be difficult to discern even with large and well-designed long-term epidemiological studies. That was in 1991. But we know from this symposium information, from, for example, Dr. Ward Alecki told us about the, my, the small brains, the microcephaly, the, the spina bifida, we know about the thyroid cancers, leukemias, etc., and the premature aging of people in Russia, for example, whose lifespan dropped 20 years since Chernobyl. Then there was Three Mile Island. Nobody died at Three Mile Island, right? 
No cancer effects possible. That occurred in 1979, and everybody was told it was due to stress. So Dr. Wing reanalyzed the medical reports and noted that they did not fit the scenario of stress-induced acute effects, some kind, sometimes called mass hysteria, mass hysteria in the medical literature. So he reanalyzed local hospital data on cancer incidents, especially lung cancer, in a population of 160,000 in Harrisburg. Uh, everybody lived within 10 miles of the plant, and then uh, they were all exposed to the same detection bias then. And there were 5,493 incident cancers that occurred from 1975 to 1985. But he noticed that the highest cancer rates that occurred in two to seven years following the accident in 1979 occurred in the highest dose regions or levels of radiation exposure that are, we mapped out here for you, or he mapped out here for you. And again, he says the cancer rates rose dramatically where the plumes or emissions were estimated to have traveled in the first days after the accident. But the risk project projection said there would be no effects. He told us that Robert Del Tradici, who put out the book called The People of Three Mile Island, uh, many people reported to him reddening of the skin, death of their pets and animals, hair loss, nausea, vomiting, etc., and they were told it was due to stress. No, it could be from radiation. Then there's the study of childhood leukemias around the 16 nuclear plants in Germany. The projection is there will be no cancers observed among people who are exposed to routinely operating nuclear plants. Uh, we should note that these studies have never been done in the United States. So they studied less than five-year-olds and found more than a doubling of childhood leukemias within five kilometers of the plants within the zero to five kilometer zone from the plant compared to further away. The conclusion by the authors was that radiation exposure near nuclear power plants in Germany is a factor of 1,000 to 100,000 less than the annual average exposure for medical exams. Therefore, the observed positive distance trend remains unexplained. In other words, a doubling of childhood leukemias within five kilometers of the plant compared to further away. Because they couldn't conclude anything from the studies because they don't comport with the atomic bomb studies and their projected risk estimates. Yet we know that there are increased leukemia rates um, and with the studies in Hanford and the neural tube def defects there, two studies and the Sellafield study, so basically, Dr. Wing said, it's happening, we can't explain it, it can't be from the nuclear plants, that's what they said. So he said, our science is affected by our political system. And the main threat is lack of critical thinking, including, yes, self-critical thinking. And the failure to question authority, for example, a lifespan study, is one of the big problems. And this lifespan study is applied all the time, every day, for legal situations, workman's comp, estimating health effects of the Fukushima events. But authority is important because it controls jobs, research funding, professional meetings, attendance, journals, so on. So he said that science is not perfect, and you can't always rely on narrow studies that are imperfectly designed to get you to the truth. This is Dr. Miller signing off for today. We'll be continuing these updates as we go along, trying to finish off the last few for you.